Hang on. Okay, great. great. Looking forward. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is Thursdays with Tom. We have a wonderful uh, show for you tonight, if that's the right, uh, right expression. This is Idajo Live, the place where classical music happens. And we are going to be coming from different places where classical music is so allied. I'm in Heidelberg, Germany, and my guest this evening, the wonderful, extraordinary violinist Gil Shaham, is at the Bard School of Music in what is the city, Gil? Uh, I guess it's Annandale on Hudson in yep. New York, in New York State. I, I believe that's right. But I'm Annandale so happy, so happy to be with you, and so thrilled to be here at Bard too. It's going to be. I forgot to turn my telephone, ladies and gentlemen. That, and, and if I was in a performance, somebody would have shot me now, but we're not. Anyway, sorry about that. Telephone's dead. We're back on it. Anyway, as you can see, we have the wonderful Gil Shaham. We are at Bard. We are in Heidelberg. I run Elite Academy in Heidelberg, and I just spent a wonderful week with some wonderful young singers. Uh, and we're trying to pick up where we left off, of course, all over the world, and especially in Central Europe right now. The COVID terror is picking back up. So restrictions are coming back in, and we're all sort of trying to behave ourselves and get to the neutral places we need to get to be safe. But we were able to have a, a good session this week. Um, we are speaking with Mr. Shaham because I believe, when is it? You're having uh, your Zoom, your concert is when? Um, it will be Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, which I guess is 8 p.m. European time. Exactly. I'll be, I'll be up at the... It'll the be 18, yeah, the WGBH Studios in Boston. In Boston, yes. And don't I say it again. That is 18 October. Uh, uh, and yes, at and it'll be streamed 24 hours live if you can't get the, the real the real program. But anyway, Gil and I go a long way back. We, we were just trying to figure out how that goes back. But I have to admit, Gil, as much as I know you and, and I know David and your sister's husband and your circle, and all, I don't know a lot about the beginning gill other than what i've read so I, I it would just interest me and i'm sure everybody else you know I, when i see your bio i see you know extraordinary achievements and so on, but i do see what i see where you were born but i see an enormous israeli influence and, oh, and yeah. debuts in jerusalem and and tel aviv and so forth can you can you give us an early gill picture absolutely absolutely you know it was it was the most amazing drive up to Bard today. It's, it's about an hour and 50 minutes from my house. And I thought, you know, it's incredible scenery. The foliage is spectacular. And I switched on the radio and it, it was kind of like a concert, you know. And so I heard uh, a Pergolesi flute concerto, which I Wonderful. didn't know before, but something that's so sublime, so beautiful. And then I heard a Chopin F minor piano concerto. And, you know, these are pieces that it just takes you back. And, and I just think, you know, what a miracle. What a miracle to have lived with this. And it got me thinking about childhood, just as you were asking. You know, I'm married to a violinist, Adele Anthony. We have three kids. And we've gotten to spend a bunch of time with children in the last time and kids are always responding to mm. music and i remember for me i was um like you say i was born in the u.s i was born in illinois i think you're a midwesterner as well is that I right was, well I, I was i was born in a city i never yes i was born in elkhart indiana right but i was three months old and dad moved us all out to washington state so i'm a northwest boy but yes so, the midwest is my family's so similarly, I guess I was born in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, which maybe you know. Yes. And, uh, grew up in Jerusalem, in, in Israel. Ah, so you actually did grow up there. You were born in, in, in Illinois, but, but your, your family was relocated for a while in Israel. My childhood was all, was all there. Ah, right. There was okay. always, I didn't know that. There was always music, you know. People were oh. always singing and in... And, and, kindergarten and in classes and in nursery school somehow Wonderful. music is just part part of who we were and i imagine that would have been the same in the northwest for you no 
Well, it depends on the family. My mother was very extremely musical, and I was raised in a similar religious environment as yours in that the Seventh-day Adventists. So there's a huge, a huge, which is, you know, the old Jewish laws with the New Testament. Never mind. We're not going to have that conversation. But but yes, music, 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 without question. But I can't imagine. You actually lived in in Jerusalem, not in Tel Aviv, but in Jerusalem. Yeah, in, in Jerusalem. I guess my family's claim to fame is that we are something like 10th generation Jerusalemites, you know, going back to oh the goodness. early 1700s. Wow. But I, of course, was born in Champaign-Urbana, so I broke... I broke the chain, but the rest of the family. Are, your, uh, mother, your mother was on vacation and, and forgot she was going to have a child. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my parents were both at the university there. And, All right. Uh, I don't know if you've come across the, the music department there. They, they have yes, many phenomenal. concerts. Yeah, phenomenal. And so and I wasn't connected to that. My parents were scientists and ah. uh, they were studying there at the uni at, um, University of Illinois. So where, so where did the music come from? I mean, a great environment, so but in your family, you know, grandma, uncle, you know? It's a good question. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I have one memory of my parents. Um, one day my dad went, I, I must have been five or six years old, and he went and reached very far back in the closet, you know, <laughs> And he took out his violin, you oh, know, and violin. that's really the only time that I remember him taking out a violin. And uh, my mother sat down at the piano and they started playing a, um, they started playing the menuet, the, the second movement of Beethoven G major wow. sonata. And it left an impression. I mean, somehow, you know, I was this little kid sort of looking at, you know, what are they doing? Um, but I thought, you know, this is something special. And, but I mean, Gil, this is kind of, I mean, my goodness, you could write a novel. And, and I love how you describe things. But was this a unique event? It was a unique event. I, I only have one such memory. And I have an older brother who began studying piano. And maybe that was around that time. I guess I don't know. I'll I bet, I'll bet if we mom. looked it up, it's the day that Alfred that Albert Einstein died, and <laughs> and and everybody got out the, the violin that they thought they could play or something. I mean, I'm trying not to be trivial, but that's that's extraordinary. So when you were going to school, as you're a writing man, the novel already. You're writing. I'm, the novel. I'm, I'm 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 I've got it half blocked. <laughs> when you're going to school in Jerusalem. You're, it's just a normal school, and somewhere along the line, you say, "I would like to study music," or, "Gee, can I have a, a violin?" Or, I mean, studying violin in Jerusalem seems like a no-brainer to me. But I, uh, <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of violin music around for sure. Um, my older brother was taking piano lessons, uh -huh. and I think I was, you know, I was a little kid. I was jealous. I wanted to be different, and okay. I, um, I asked for violin. And we, we actually had a, another sabbatical year planned for Champaign-Urbana. Okay. And my parents sort of said, well, you know, why don't we talk about it when we come back? I think my mother was hoping I would forget about it. She was not a fan of little kids wow. playing the violin. She said little children playing the violin feels like fingernails on the chalkboard. Well, or, I mean, you know, knives, metal knives scraping, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I get that, Mom. I get it completely. You know, now, I have, but I think I, do I remember that you had the beginning with many different yes. instruments? Yes, oh, good for you. I don't know why you know that. I, somehow, I, I think you, did you say tuba or something? Or? Yes, yes, absolutely. Tuba. I, that's, yeah. that's what I, I started, however, on drums. Uh, well, actually, I started on piano. Mom wanted mom played the piano very well and by ear, and she played the organ and all that. So all of we are two older sisters. So piano was a sine qua non. Um, I had a rather difficult relationship uh, with. I loved playing the piano. We then moved, and it was a new area, you know. And I was just in that time where where you know little league was more important than practicing piano. And then I got this dreadful piano teacher, teacher who is you know the stereotype black black dress nerd up, and she put the hymnal on the on the piano and said we're going to learn four part harmony you know come and sit the feet of jesus and i thought i'd lose my mind so i played literally i left the <laughs> anyway but i love music here i banged on this i played the cornet for quite some time 
Uh, and and then I, and I'm always sang. I was always a tall kid with a pretty voice and you know alto barrel. But then in my junior high, and then we'll get back to you. But in my junior high year, the, the band teacher came to me and he said, "Look, I know you played the cornet and you're musical, and you know you want to have a go at the trump at the tuba." And I found the whole thing such a lark and so re and so crazy. And I took to it. I mean, it just made sense to me. B flat and three valve tuba. And so I played tuba for, you know, two or three years. And then I had to decide between tuba and the, and the choir and the girls in the choir were much cuter. So I went with the choir. <laughs> uh, 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 but what is tuba hard? Is that, that, what does that do to your embouchure? Is that? Well, I mean, yeah, you get, you get, tuba. you get big round things in your face, but when you're, when you're 13 or 14, I guess you don't really care so much, but I was actually quite good at it. I mean, I played it. I even played a, a, a tuba solo with the, with the uh, with the um with the little band in my school there and, and of course it was named asleep in the deep <laughs> <laughs> anyway back to you this is about you not about me this is very fun i love the fact that there's a piano it's a wonderful picture you and the piano and so do you still play did you play the piano did you get no i wish i wish i did i oh, took yeah. a few lessons <laughs> and i uh you know, I didn't really display any talent and I kind of felt like, well, there might not be any, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I ended up just sticking with violin. And now I would love to go back and spend time and become fluent with piano <clears throat> because I, I think there is something about, you know, the feeling of harmony and counterpoint, like you say, four part harmony. Mm. Um, I remember talking to, um, to organists and right. saying, look, Tell me about fugues. What's a good book to read right. Right. about right. improvising fugues? Right. And, they, and they said, well, Gil, you don't improvise fugues by reading the book. <laughs> it's all about how your fingers feel at the instrument. And so maybe in another lifetime, I'd like to learn the piano and I'd like to learn the tuba too. No, the tuba is, a, I think the organ would be more interesting. Isn't that amazing? It's an amazing organist. instrument, right? Yeah. That yeah, but you've got this you've got this pesky day job. I mean, you know, so I, it's you're going to have to find some time for your piano. We're going to get to that, but still getting through. See, so you're a kid. You're going through school. You're taking some violin lessons, and and you loved working at the violin, and you showed some kind of talent for it. I mean, you know, people say, "Well, you know, Gil, this is not bad," right? <laughs> I was very lucky with it and I, and I did love it, you know. My first teacher was um, the kindest man by the name of Shmuel Bernstein. You know, oh, um, he was not related to Leonard Bernstein, people yeah. often ask, but he was this wonderful man who came to Israel from Lithuania uh, by, by way of Germany. He, he escaped the war and ended up in, in Jerusalem. He, in fact, taught my father when he was young. And when I was studying with him, he was in his 80s. And he taught us all to love music. Huh. And, um, you know, at the end of every lesson, he would give us a little piece of candy, you know, <laughs> which um, I, which I, uh, I confess I, I liked. You know, I didn't mind the candy. And um, now, wait a minute, was the candy, did you always get the candy or, or did you had to have shown a, a bit of a proficiency? The candy was a reward? I think it was presented as a reward, but it was always presented. You know? I love it. <laughs> so, you know, you don't deserve this this week, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and he, he was very generous with his time and all of us that studied with him just became passionate about music because he loved music, you know? Um, yeah. And, and so in, how long were you in Israel? Did you, through college or through high oh, school? Yeah. Or through so, college, through college? so then that was my childhood. I guess I was 11 years old when my parents went to New York. They moved for, and I guess the original plan was a, another sabbatical year. Okay. Uh, my mother went to the Sloan Kettering Institute. My father went to Columbia University. And, um, and I was lucky enough to uh, get into the Juilliard pre-college right. division right. 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 and um, meet some people there. And, uh, and, and there were three of us. I have an older brother and my younger sister, Orly. I think maybe you know Orly. Yes. Yeah, Orly is, is David Robertson's wife. 
That's correct. Yes. And David, David and I have done a lot of concerts together, actually. And I think the last time we actually saw each other was was in, actually saw each other was in St. Louis. I think that's I, probably. I, there was a sort of like a Thanksgiving time, and there was a concert, and David, ah no, Gil, you played with David at that concert, of course. Are we? Is this the New Year's? Con Could it have been a New Year's? No, this is this is like five or six years ago. Oh, maybe. I was yes, a while yes, back. That I don't sounds remember. right. You, you, it sounds to me like you're like, ladies and gentlemen, you'll love this. Artists, when they talk to each other, we have a horrible past tense memory, but we can tell you what is going to be for lunch in two and a half years between the two rehearsals before the performance on the 16th. Is that not true? I, that's pretty true. I have to say, I'm, uh, I was always this for Blunget, you know, it's not, <laughs> you know. Um, it gets Adele, worse, you know. I, my kids I, keep me in line and Adele keeps me in line. Yeah, but in the, in terms of wherever you've done something, you know, to me, 1993, 2003 or 2001, you know, they, they, they kind of go into a block. You know, I'm, I'm not nearly as sensitive to individual years going backwards as I am moving forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's Certainly. right. You know, we're always planning our future season, the next season, the season after our repertoire for the future seasons. And then, uh, yeah, somehow... Yeah, I, I do remember us meeting and in St. Louis, but That's I right. do also have a memory of us maybe having a lunch at Vienna, in Vienna or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in Vienna. Like we that was going school. even further back. And know? there was also an, there was also an Orfeo concert that you were doing up on in the Rose Building. That's, I came that's to. right. Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, is that right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And you were playing, in fact, I, I think it was a series you were doing with them. It was about you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As it rightfully should have been. I think we... Uh, well, anyway, yeah. this is silly. You, what I just came across, you you have been... Let, let's talk a little bit about this horrible season and the COVID time, uh, the COVID, what I call the COVID sabbatical. And I'm, by the, ladies and gentlemen, I am not playing light. This is a horrible pandemic. It has been a crisis. It is a crisis of, of profound existential issues for artists, especially across the globe. Um, the financial disaster implied by, by the, the standalone artists that have been, have lost their livelihoods. I mean, I don't, I, we've all had experiences of feeling like somebody just unplugged us from the wall. Um, but there has been a tremendous effort to stay connected, to make music and help make it available in whatever manner possible. But I was a little surprised to read You've been rather in Europe rather extensively of late, haven't you? Um, yeah, I guess this was my first real tour after wow. after COVID. You know, this is really, it's like you say, these are tragic times. You know, people, oh, totally. people have really gone through tragedies and thankfully, you know, we, we've been okay. Um, but there is kind of an ironic twist where you know, we've been able to slow things down. We've been able yeah. to examine ourselves, look at our lives and think about who we want to be, what we want to be, who we want to help. Um, as you say, the arts community, it's really been like a, like a gut punch, you know, when I think- I, I, these... I read the other day that 1600 symphony orchestra organizations in the United States alone are in full stop. Oh, that's tragic. 16, yeah, I mean, 1600 is a bad number, but how many people are in orchestra? 50 to 80? Something Do like the math. That. I mean, oh my God, you know, this is... And, and it's global and yeah. sustained for months. I mean, it's, it's much worse than, you know, a, a other natural tragedy, you know, a hurricane that hits or something like this. Well, exactly. It's I mean, really it's a perfect global storm. global thing. You know, the perfect storm is the, is the pandemic, the shutdown, the economic disaster, the re, the re, the rebuilding, the reassociation, and yet having all these restrictions. And now, you know, everybody's now unfortunately completely in tune to, you know, everybody said the fall is going to be tough, and obviously it's going to get tough. I'm over here in Europe, and you know, pockets are starting to shut down, and and. You know, some of the messages are really, really quite alarming. And of course, we don't want to get into the, any of the politics of it, but America's response to the pandemic has been less than ideal. 
I'm trying to be diplomatic about it because it's not our business to talk about that tonight, but it is our business to talk about all the myriad blessed ways in which artists have tried to band together, hold one another up, enormous collegial embracing going on, uh, identifying with the worst case scenarios we've had, as well as as the few of us that have been able to you know, branch out and be of some service and help. Uh, and of course, making music. I haven't been able to make music, but I've enjoyed very much developing this series in Idajo and, and getting to meet colleagues that I either don't know or haven't seen for years and having conversations about music that I don't get to talk about very much. I mean, what you play and what you do, and I want to get to our program, but I'm still I'm still crawling through your biography uh, <laughs> because, because at some point, you know, when would you say you became Gil Shaham? When did that happen? I mean, you know what I mean? That's, we all know when that happens in our life. All of a sudden, okay, that's happening. I mean, look, you're the instrumentalist of the year for Musical America a couple of years ago. You're the, you're the you're cat's pajamas and you've won Grammys. You've, you know, all this kind of, but when was it that you felt I'm Gil Shaham? You know, I guess uh, we all have kind of demarcation points in our lives, yeah. you know, things that have happened. And I think for us, definitely, for both for Adele and myself, um, you know, having kids was a complete change in, in the way we live in the world and all that. If, if I were to think musically, I, I would say around that time too, oh. things changed. And, and I'm just now when you were asking that, I was thinking of um, Maestro Lauren Mazel, uh, who many years ago told me, he said, Gil, you'll see. With music, the older you get, the more you enjoy it. And I think I'm starting to I'm starting to understand that now. It's absolutely true, isn't it? Don't you find? Yeah, that's that's a that, yeah. You would expect something like that from Mr. Mazel. <laughs> it's it really it's really now that you realize how fragile it is, how miraculous it is, and maybe in a way, these crazy COVID times um, help us appreciate that too. You know, so now I was in Atlanta first, and then I went to Paris. Um, in Atlanta, we played a virtual concert without audience. Okay. Um, but just to be there with all the fellow musicians, all of us together playing a Beethoven violin concerto with Maestro Spano, Robert Spano. Um, Wonderful. And we were all just feeling, this is really special. This is really yeah. miraculous. And we were so happy to be there. Yeah. Then I went to Paris. And in Paris, they had not full audience, but they had, um, I think it was 50% with wow. um, Maestro Pavo Yarvi and- uh, Oh, wonderful. And Orchestre Paris. And uh, yeah, yes. and so wonderful. And what were you playing and I there? At the, and I looked at the audience and there we played the Tchaikovsky Concerto. And I, and I feel audiences too, listeners, everybody has a, a new appreciation for, you know what, you know what it is really at, at a time. I mean, it's a, I was going to say appreciation of music, of course, right. but, but there's something about it at a time when we have all lost so much. People have lost um, loved ones, you know, mm. people have lost, you know, their, their dreams. They, they've lost you know, they're things they've built up for 30 years. People have lost their individual liberties. I mean, many, many things. And now we really appreciate our shared humanity and on a very deep That's level. Beautiful. And I think, uh, I think in a That's way, in, in a way, there's something about, um, there's something about these times and the tragedy of these times that ironically brings out something beautiful in all of us too. That's very beautifully said, Gil. That's uh, one uh, one can sure. could use a little editing, but something like that. <laughs> no, I think that what I'm always wanting to encourage our audience, and of course our audience for for this for this uh, Idajo live series, are people who love music and they're curious. They want to know people behind it, the names and so forth and and so forth. But they get what the classical music idiom is. Idajo is all about classical music. It's a classical streaming platform that's built by classical musicians for the classical user interface, which is exists nowhere else in the world. Spotify and Apple, they're all wonderful services, but they don't. They can't. They 
it's the, it's a question of metadata. They don't, you know, they don't, it doesn't quite fit. So that's already the first entry. But there's always a, a level of, of people that are curious that I, I feel compelled to encourage them to understand that classical musicians, by and large, feel that what they do is a calling. It is a responsibility to their talent more than it is the high end of an entertainment industry. And, and so the way you just described these reunions that were happening, I hadn't, I've had four concerts since February. You know, somebody just pulled me, my plug out of the, out of the wall. But I had, a, I had a, a recital on Mahler's birthday, July 7th in, in Zurich. And I, you know, it was like, it, it, from all of us, but it just, it was like drug addicts getting their fix. It was funny, there was real live music and we were sharing these, whether they knew the songs or didn't. There was just that amazing energy and you say, the happiness in in the sense of fulfillment, you know, which was just overwhelming from 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 both sides of the of the of the stage. So I think that it's beautiful to hear you say that. And Wonderful. I know you're you're a great Malarian and always, but I think just to be there to celebrate Malarian's yeah. birthday in a room full of people together and have that music. That's such a that's such a wonderful thing to do. Let me ask you some mundane questions and, you know, things that people might be curious. About. How big is your repertoire? Does it span <laughs> classic to modern? Uh, do you ever play folk music uh, when you're home and you just don't give a damn? Do you used to find yourself saying, oh, Stefan Grappelli, eat your heart out? <laughs> oh, I would love to. I would have loved to. I guess it's a pretty classical training. But yeah. um, but I I play everything, you know. Yeah. I hear something. I'm very um, childish this way. I hear something and I think oh, I love this, and um, I want to play this. And one one of the pieces we'll do Sunday was a piece that I heard um, th this summer. I I did a little series for fun with my friend Laurie Niles from Violinist.com. Right. And uh, this was kind of inspired by my the headmaster at my kid's school who went online and started reading children's books. And he was having such a blast. I, I became hooked. I started, you know, tuning in to Dr. Kelly reading kids books Thursday nights, you know, I love and, it. And I thought, you know, maybe we could do something like that. And, uh, and, um, and my friend Vijay Gupta came and joined yeah. us and he is a brilliant, guy on many levels he's a beautiful violinist and he played a piece for us that his wife wrote rena esmail okay and uh and i just thought it was so moving and it was so beautiful and um you know after he played for us i said look vijay i want to learn this piece can i learn is it okay if i try and learn this piece and and play it and so i that will be one of the one of the pieces on our program Oh, I love it. On Sunday, and I'd love to say even more about this because it's such, such. A well, we're going to get the, get the thing is you now. Uh, uh, before COVID hit, uh, before this season, do you feel like you've been pretty active in the media world? Of, of late, you've been extremely active online, and and what is that? What is that difference or relationship for you when you're online or not online? Or like you said, you were with Bob Spano, but but you didn't have anybody in the audience. You're planning. What is that experience for you right now? It's so funny. I think we all learned how to like put our phones on a music stand and yeah, put, yeah. put the stand up on a chair and find the and try to record. And I, you know, um, I'm now talking to you from my computer, but I have an external mic. I don't think I ever had an external <laughs> mic for my computer. So we're all learning a little bit about yeah. technology and that's always a good thing, you yes. know? Um, but um, yeah, is it different I, for you? Is it different for you to perform when you know it's just online? You know, I think it's a different genre. It really is. You know, when you're doing a live stream concert, um, you are alone in a room with cameras. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. but there could be somebody, you know, there could be somebody in Israel who's with you at that moment. What? Exactly. I mean, in South America, you know, in, in my experience, it, it feels like when we record and you're trying to bring all everything you possibly can when you're recording. But somewhere in the back of your mind, 
Exactly. There's somebody in Argentina having a listen to this or, or Seoul, Korea, you know, whatever it might be. And which is kind of a, does that, does that, is that in your mind? I think so. You really are creating moments together, you know, and with a recording, I think you're always cognizant of the fact that, you know, you know you'll, you'll hear it again and again. And right, again, right, you know? right. Whereas with a live stream, concert i don't know it's it's somehow different from the broadcast concerts that i used to do because those had audiences right uh, but this is really you're in the room and there are people in other rooms around the world and you're sharing yeah. moments together it sounds like you like that i think it's fascinating i <laughs> I, I don't feel like i've done it enough to be comfortable with it like usual concerts but um but I, I do think it's kind of a new genre. I think I think I think I do like it. Yes. I think I agree with you. I think it is a new genre, and I think I, I like to talk about the the global concert hall as sort of the third rail of performance because we're now in an analog, digital, simultaneous world, and and one thing that the global concert hall insists, of course, and and rightfully so, is the is the digital green room. You're going to visit with people on the 18th after the yes. performance, which I think is I think you're going to really quite like and i know I everybody that. else is going to like that but let me ask you something flashback when was the last time you walked out on stage with no microphones nice full audience in your tux and played your normal repertoire when was that i can tell you exactly it was march 12th okay with the london symphony orchestra and okay. we already knew it was already touch and go because we didn't shake hands you know there's tradition uh. You shake hands with the concertmaster or with the conductor. So we, we didn't. Um, and that, that was it. I think I was on one of the last flights from the UK back to, back to New York. Does so that seem I a long actually, time ago? I, does it seem does like it seem a long time? Yeah, it does, huh? It really does. But, what was but it, now what that we, you? do you miss it? Do you feel like you're in sort of a, well, I'm trying to get by or, or are we in a, are we in a new, are we in a new now or, 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 or are we all still hoping that we actually can go back? These are good questions. Um, I, I don't know. What, what would you say? What would, what do you think? I'm totally convinced we're in a new now. Yeah. I think we're going to, I think we're in, I think we're in so many layers of a new now, both technically and the performance we're talking about, but also the repertoire. I think that when orchestras start gearing back up again, there's going to be a much wider consciousness to actually playing different kinds of sounds and cultures and evidences of them. I, I mean, I'm hoping that that's, that's true. Uh, the practical side of things, I think, are, are, are slightly less positive. I think there's going to be less people being able to make music. I think that all those difficulties are going to come. What concerns me is that, is that our societies could get used to having less access to the arts. And and that bothers me deeply because I think the arts are fundamentally far more important than their entertainment value. I think you would agree with me that what we feel we're doing when we perform, sing, play, we're giving evidence of humanity over a long period of time. We are making timelessness hearable so that people can inform their own lives. And, and I think we thriving, feel kind of pretty pa passionate about it. Yeah. Thriving societies have thriving arts. There's no yeah. question about it. Looking back, you know, it's absolutely true, you know. Well, you know, long, going on to, and, and moving into the concert. So if, if, with this, if this is a new now and you've been doing so much online, is there a difference in programming in your mind online or non-online concerts? Well, I guess I was wondering actually about, about you, you know, because I, it's not, I asked I do, you first. The program I will do on Sunday is solo violin, oh, which, is, which is very rare for me. You know, I think, yeah. I think you know, that, what, that's what pianists must feel like, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. If, do you have, ever have occasion to do a completely solo program without pianists, without... Um, oh, I, I don't think I don't I, to sing to sing for very long without a pianist, I think would annoy people enormously. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've done some very long, beautiful recitals in the shower, 
but that doesn't count. Um, and no, I'm always my 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 solo turn needs needs the partner or the piano. But I'm more interested. I mean, for instance, and 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 ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do some screen sharing here pretty soon. We're going to drop the needle a bit. But I'm just looking at your I'm just looking at your program, uh, and please talk us through it. But I mean, you've honestly bookcased it with the Bach. Yes. Uh, and and I can imagine any time a violinist gets the chance to play solo Bach partitas and toccatas and all those things, it must be a, a blessing. It's the greatest joy, you know, it really is. Many people have said it before me, and I only started doing this, you know, later, I guess I was in my 30s, um, but that, there's no greater joy than, than playing Bach. Why? And, uh, why, why, why? Tell us why. I'm a person, I'm an I'm adult, I've never heard, I'm an idiot, I may go on and listen. Tell me why I should go listen to Bach. You know, people say, I've heard people say, when I practice Bach, I feel, I feel like I'm, I become a better person. You know, people say, like, when I hear Bach, I, I feel like, I feel like I become a better, a better person. What do you think that is? Do you think it's the melody and the harmony? Do you think it's the, it's the essential reasonable structure of the music? I mean, it's a conversation that can be complex, complex, but you're you're gonna you're gonna come home at some point, or you're there's a complete journey. What what, what would you describe that? You know, I I wish I could say exactly, but I can tell you when I go to my room, and let's say I set aside forty five minutes to practice Bach, um, inevitably. You know, an hour later or an hour and a half later, I'm like, oh, it's already the time, the time has passed. He was such such a master that it's it almost it, you can't believe that this was written by a fellow human. You know, it's true. But, but he was very concerned with the emotional effect of music, and we know this from from his letters and from his writings. You know, he would talk about. Uh, a certain fugal technique that he felt would would not produce sufficient emotional satisfaction you know mm -hmm. so he was very in tune to what his listeners feel when they hear this music and there's an extensive repertoire for for solo violin isn't there or solo instruments in fact in the bach repertoire I mean, he wrote a lot of, so, of music didn't he you know, we, we don't have anything like what the pianists have, but, but in, from Bach, we have these very special six solos. And they're a very unusual output for Bach um, right. in, in many ways. I, I guess one of the legends was, you know, Bach was orphaned as a very young right. boy. He was nine when I think, I think nine years old by the time he lost both his mother and his father. But the story was that his father had taught him to play the violin before he died. And so maybe these pieces mm. had a special significance to Bach himself. Okay. They are also very unusual in that they are sonatas alternating with partidas. So when you look at his other collections, you have the English suites, the French suites, you know, things like that, the cello suites, they're always dance suites, but with the violin solos, he alternates between sonatas and partidas. And I guess there's a lot of questions about what, what that can, means. Can I, can I ask you to explain to us who don't live in this world the difference between a sonata and a partita? Well, I wish I knew. It's a, good, it's a great <laughs> question. It's a great question. I guess when we think about, of a partita, we think of a suite of dances. And right. a sonata is more, um, is more musical form you know it's, it's more an instrumental right. thing that um, right. usually has has four movement and you know i actually have i have the fiddle here so i thought oh, now, now please you have to tell us yeah now that you've now that you've brought it into the room it's, it, you know tell us about this extraordinary instrument well this, this is actually a new violin made by andranik kaparian in massachusetts in um, ah in three years ago but i do play a wonderful Stradivarius. You, you, you play this amazing Stradivarius that's a bit longer and fuller. And I mean, it sounds like an incredibly unique thing. That's true. Yes, that's an, a beautiful, the Polignac Strad. The which, Polignac. Which has been my violin since uh, 
30 years. So your solo, your solo recordings are with that violin. Are with that violin, yeah. And that's a, a Stradivari, 1699, plus wow. tax, you know, wow. plus uh, value added tax. No, I, that's that's just my I saw, I saw. It's <laughs> Sorry, for you, I was looking. 1499. <laughs> no, it's. Uh, <laughs> It, oh, it was made in the okay. year 1699. But I should also yeah. say that I have been playing a wonderful Strad also from um, a foundation in New York called In Consortium, um, which is a violin from 1719 called the Haupt Stradivarius, which I love to play right. as well. And now, I'm how does this work with violins? They very often these these incredible violins belong to a foundation or belong to somebody else, and they're they're given to you. Or you can can one just sorry for the word rent them, or do they you have to qualify for it? Or and I suppose what you have to pay the insurance. Or I mean, how how does it's a it's a world I don't know much about, and and I don't want nasty details or or awful details. But but no, I mean, I, these I are would... extraordinarily expensive instruments. They're extraordinarily expensive. I do own the Polignac. I'm very lucky to play this violin. Wow. It's owned by a um, very generous benefactor of the arts in, um, based in Washington, D.C. Wow. And it, through this in-consortium group that uh, helps young musicians, young musicians and, uh, and uh, middle-aged musicians to um, have That's access wonderful. to really the top violins, you know. And um, yeah, so I'm really very, very lucky. Very, very, very lucky with these. With these Did violins. you pick up this extraordinary thing to for a point? Other yeah, than you, you, were, you were asking about the box and uh, yeah. you know, pa part of what we do is we're, I always think our job is a little bit like the job of an actor, right? We have to yeah. take what's on the page and bring it to life for right. our audience. But to understand what's on the page is not so easy. And, um, you know, somebody explained to me about the Baroque preludium and fugue, pre prelude and fugue form. Right, right. And, and I love this analogy. They said, okay. think of Baroque churches, think of the Baroque architecture. Mm -hmm. And what happens is you, you, stand outside the church or maybe you even step inside it and you're overwhelmed. You're awe-inspired by the size of it, by the grandeur mm. of it, mm. by the sheer number of ornamental details and then by the, by the beauty of all those details, you know. really like you know it's all beautiful and overwhelming and awe inspiring but what does it mean and your and your brain tries to make sense of everything that you're seeing mm -hmm. and you realize that you are being slowly guided towards the focal point you know which may be you know in a church it may be the altar or i suppose it could be the expression on the face of saint teresa you know, on the, in that yeah. uh, Bernini statue. And, and really, once that focal point is distilled, that's when the story begins. And that's the equivalent of the first statement of the theme of the fugue. Etc. Etc. You know. Exactly. But Does I this think mean, maybe that yeah. is the aesthetic of it? You know. I, I love the idea that that do you do you have do you have not just association, but do you have in all of these pieces some kind of storyline? For yeah, lack so of a I, better, I do believe those sonatas are narratives. You know, and those yeah. fugues they they often start with a prelude and fugue. And those fugues do tell a story. 
and very yeah. often it's a religious text, you know, very, very mm. often some sort of a religious story, but, mm. but sometimes not, you know. Um, and by contrast, if you look at the suite of dances, and we will finish the concert on Sunday with um, a dance suite, um, I think I, I hear those pieces a bit differently these days after reading an article about the Baroque suites where they said All right. Baroque dances reflect hierarchy in Baroque mm. society, which I'd never thought of before. It's very strange for me living Hi in New York. Hierarchy, hierarchy in the sense of social hierarchy? Social hierarchy. So All right. the first dance is always danced by the king and queen alone. Right. Only the two. Maybe the, maybe the king and queen of the ball, you know? And so they dance a very stately allemande, you know? Or in this case, it, on Sunday, it'll be a lure. You know, uh, it's a very stately dance without much facial expression and, you know, very formal. And bit by bit, more people join in. So you'll have more of the nobility mm. joining mm. for mm. A, a courant, you know, maybe mm. a running dance, you mm. know? And then things really start loosening up when you have a saraband and you have, mm. you know, many, many hand gestures and facial expressions. And at the end, everybody dances a jig, you know? And so that, that will be the ending piece on our, uh, on our program. So I it's a love little it. bit Baroque, now, Baroque with 21st century music in between. I was going to say, you've, you've got this and everybody will come and tune in because of that. But... You've taken us through a very interesting on the program. And, and by the way, I think what I'm going to do right now, while you keep talking, tell us about the program. Why those pieces and how do you choose the pieces that, that, that are lively in between these wonderful Bach conversations? And while you're telling that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go to screen sharing and into idadjo.com. Go ahead, Gil. Well, you know, I, you know, the first piece that I'll play after the G minor sonata, that magnificent Bach piece, um, was a piece that I was very honored and, and thrilled to receive via email from my friend, composer Scott Wheeler, who is a great master and writes many different styles of music, is just a very fluent composer. And he said, Gil, I've written a piece that's inspired by the COVID lockdown. You oh know? My. And, it's, and it's a solo rag for violin. And he titled it Isolation Rag. And so I was really very honored. I was so happy to receive this email and I immediately, you know, downloaded the, the PDF and started learning the, the, the piece. And is it, that has that hasn't been recorded, has it? No, no. But we can have, no, have ladies and gentlemen. What you what you what you saw me do is we went onto the. I'm on the I'm on the website of the idadjo.com and I put in Gil's name and you can see a pretty extensive discography. Where I really welcome you to and encourage you to drop the needle on. Uh, it's you know, it's an incredible. And of course, here's here's going to be some some Bach sonatas and partitas. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is wow. quite wonderful. And then what happens, what you can do is once you get a nice piece, you can put it in your playlist. But I want to go over to here to not live compare, but where am I? I'm looking for what's on coming up next. I'd like to, here's the go by. Ah, ha, ha. can you imagine tonight of all nights is my concert with the Avena Academy and, uh, and, um, Wow. Martin Hasselberg doing Beethoven and Schubert, and Benjamin Schmidt played the, the Beethoven uh, 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 concerto, which I'm sure oh. you like. But anyway, we're going to go down here because your program is that actually... That concert is tonight, coming up in a couple of hours. Yes, at 8 right? o'clock, in, in, in 10 minutes. So I need to get everybody out of here so they can go to my concert. But I really? love the fact, look at this, look at this, Gil. We're absolutely in the same in the same hitting distance, right? So here we are. I love it. We're right on top of each other, or I'm on top of you. Never mind. Uh, in 11 minutes. So here is your concert, and we get to see the program. And we see this wonderful, you're talking about the isolation reg. Should we just yeah. have a quick look at Scott Wheeler? Oh, wow. So you can just, um, you're copying just, and pasting? Yeah, yes. and I've got Scott Wheeler now. And I've met Scott because he's writes some operas. He's written some operas. 
Yes. He's a very nice guy and a very yes. good composer. Um, I'm just wondering whether, let's see, we could even do this, Scott. We, let's see if it isolation, let's see if that comes up. Works, 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 works. I mean, Scott I think Peter he Pum sent me the piece in April. And yeah, I've, I've been playing it a little bit since then. I don't know if that's- I'm not funny. Should we just drop the needle on something? Do you know any of these titles? Here's Calamity Reg. Oh, it's all- I'm good. sure this isn't, it's all good. How, we're just gonna have about a minute of Mr. Wheeler. Firefly Lullaby. Firefly. Okay, that's a kind of, I apologize. A piece like that should not be interrupted, but then actually I'm being silly. Folks, stay with us, or actually no, leave us and go watch whatever concert you want, because you can always come back and watch the rest of this, the continuation of it, because the Idajo Live lives on idajo.com, uh, and you can, and especially the Idajo Live YouTube channel, you can you can look at it uh, for for quite some time. And now all of these conversations are being uh, broadcast as well on my own Facebook website, Thomas Hampson on Facebook, and we keep these conversations alive too. So go off if you have to. Gil and I are having too much fun, and that's Mr. Reader. But there's another, and there's another. Um, there's a, I need to go back to your. Well, I'll just go backwards. And we'll go back and find you again. Here we go. Go for concert. His, his right. range of writing styles is amazing. He it's, writes it's amazing. Poems. And it doesn't really represent. Right. I know Scott's. He absolutely right. It's, it's quite wide and wonderful fantasy and, and, and fun. I actually landed on Raimi as well as Ismail because I don't know them at all. Yes. Can you, can you talk? Can you tell us yeah. about them? Um, this piece that I'm playing, um, Max Raimi is a mild-mannered violist of, of the Chicago Symphony by day. Ah. And he's an amazing composer by night, you know? And um, he, we were working together in Chicago, I guess it was a few years back. And he said, look, Gil, I've been writing these etudes. Have a look at this one, tell me what you think. And I really dug it. This is a, it's a piece called Violin Etude Anger Management. I love you know, it. That's fantastic. Great, and it's it really suits violin, and and the writing's beautiful. Okay, so let I me let let. I think they're gonna let's drop the needle on something called klezmer dysfunction. <laughs> the guy always has, he obviously has a wonderful sense of humor. I love it. And let's see, and this is for clarinetists. So this is not anything for you, but let's have a look, and then you can tell us what if that's somewhat indicative. I mean, isn't that fun? I love that. <laughs> and that really is how he is. Incredible imagination. Very uh, funny, tongue-in-cheek humor. And then the, the craft of the writing is spectacular. It sounds, it sounds like I'm going back to your program because I want to just have uh, Rina Esmail. And where does Max live? Oh, you said he's in Chicago. He is in Chicago. Rina is California-based. And, and she was the one I mentioned to you 
before. And, you know, this, this piece that, that I heard, it was so moving. When the violin, it's based on a, on a poem that's attributed to, um, to Hafiz, you know. Ah. And, um, and it's a very beautiful poem. Should I, should I read it? I have it here. Oh, yes, it, please read really, it. Read, read it. It's not long. It's just, it's when the violin can forgive the past, it starts singing. When the violin can stop worrying about the future, you will become such a drunk laughing nuisance that God will lean down and start combing you into his hair. When the violin can forgive every wound caused by others, the heart starts singing. Oh my, whose poem is this? It's attributed to Hafiz, the, the, Hafiz. the Hafiz, yeah. Persian. The, yeah. Oh, the, I, the, I guess there's the, some question about wh who exactly wrote, but it, it's, I find it well, it was so... A, it, was a, it was the he was the inspiration for Goethe and the Westöstliche Divan. Right. I think that's right. I think that's the do same. You, do you know do you know her piece when the guitar when the guitar can forgive the past? Oh, it looks like the same. Should we have a listen? Oh, I wonder if that's similar. Let's yeah, have a listen love, and you tell us. It. What a beautiful poem. Okay, I mean that is incredibly cruel, but watch this, folks. This is one of the, this. Now I'm on the website of Adagio, and the Adagio website works like the Adagio app on your computer or your iPhone or your Android or anything else. So what I want to I want to listen to this piece later, so I can either first of all I want to know a little bit more about it, so I can click on that Chevron, and then I get all the players and where all this comes from. Text on Mohammed Sams Adin Hafiz which I think is a different Hafiz, but never mind. Oh, yeah. And then, and then this button over here, this, the, the ellipse, you can save to a collection, add to a playlist. Now, what I love is playlists. And so I'm going to playlist, and I've got a whole bunch of playlists here, but I'm, so I'm going to create one, and I'm going to call it Gil's, Gil's <laughs> Stuff. Gil's Stuff, right? And I'm going to create this playlist. Now, that playlist is now on my, I mean, now. It's on my iPad. It's on my iPhone. It's wherever I carry my iDajo. And if I go over to my playlist here like this and click on it, I'm going to have Gil's Stuff. And I click on that. It's going to be that one track. And you can actually save, save as many things as you want, and it will just follow you around. And then when you're offline, it's still with you. And if you belong to iDajo, which of course you do, you collect you, it can make your big collection, and it just follows you. Idanjo is not a record store, and it's not a recording company. Think of it more as a music library in your pocket. Anything you want in the classical. There's well over 
18, 19,000 different composers. I mean, we have just, I, I don't know this person's work and I don't know two of the people at all. And I just type things in. If you go into the alphabetical listing, which you could really get lost on Idadro, it is a wonderful world of associations. So do enjoy idadro.com. And, and, and you can just hear all sorts of things and just check it out and, and find the connections where that comes from. It's really, a, it's really a wonderful service. It's been around for several years and there's been many, many programmings work on that. Hundreds of thousands of hours uh, are in the database and the database is cross-referenced. So if you're, if you're listening to something and then there's another, uh, there's another recording in the database of that, Say you're looking, say you want to listen to Beethoven violin concertos. And of course, you want to listen to Gill play it, and it's fantastic. But when you're listening to the first movement on the right hand side, you're going to get a drop down of every other recording in the database of the, the Beethoven violin concerto, which is, you know, it's, it's wonderful. It's informative. It's a it's an association. I'm doing so much more of my song repertoire. Do you know, I can just put in a D number, just the D, D877, which I happen to know is a song of, of Schubert, mm -hmm. and the Schubert song comes up. And if I open that one window and I start to play that, everybody else's recording of that 877 comes up. I mean, it, for programming, it's a, a dream. Music students love idodger.com, but music aficionados as well. And I think it's one of the most fun platforms to simply widen your experience in 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 the classical music most of us classical musicians want to say to you if you like this you're going to love this and if you like that you're going to probably like this and if you like this why don't you try that and and you know it's a great experience and a concerts like yours on the global concert hall which is giving us the tried and true and a master of the of the bach in thought if you will and yet guiding us through new voices that are looking for the same emotional impulse and, and inviting people to their own emotional reaction to music. This is so important, Gil. We thank you very much. This is beautiful. You must have fun. Is it tough to program or is it fun to program? Oh, I'm having a blast. I, I'm, I can't wait till Sunday. This has been amazing. And I, when you were describing this resource, I was thinking, what amazing times we're lucky to, to be in. It's true, it's and true. If we wanted 20 years ago to do something like that, what could we have done? What could, I mean, attend every Look concert, go to the library, what, I don't think. Um, I've been anything. told that in, I've been told that the word crises in Chinese implies with it opportunity. And I think we should, I hope I'm right. And if I'm wrong, please, somebody who can correct me. But the idea, yes, we are in very difficult and in some ways very dark times. And, and we're not sure how this is going to go. But we have to embrace the idea we can form our own future. We do have opportunities within this dark time that can unite us, that can give classical artists a new opportunity to offer to their public their resource to classical music. And, and that's one of the reasons I love to have this. When was the last time we saw each other? We're talking about years ago. With our new technology, we can actually keep in touch. And that is one of the greatest pleasures I have about the, the iDodgeo platform, but also this, this, this series that I get to do. You know? And meeting all of you, I have got such a list of new music that I had no idea about. I saw Nico Muli's name there. And of course, Scott Wheeler, I haven't thought about for some time. Her music, the, the Ismail, she reminds me a little bit of Terry Regan, and you start dipping through all these new music things. Ah, anyway, what do you want to give us? Know, a, give us a closing. You're just about, wonderful, Gil. I was going to say there's something about connecting people yeah. with, with this age of technology. Certainly has the potential of connecting us as people to each other, and that's that can be very beautiful. And I'm very happy that we had a chance to connect today too. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. I was, you won't see me, but I will see you. I, 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 I will be Sunday evening in, in, uh, in your concert. This was, I just can't miss this. It's going to be wonderful. Thank you so much. Great to be We didn't here. even talk. By the way, you're in Bard College. We didn't even talk about that. You said that this is your first day on the job, right? This is my first day. In about an hour, I will meet my first students. I am so thrilled. I mean, I don't know if you know the area here is idyllic. It's, it's perfect foliage outside, you know, it's absolutely spectacular, New England uh, um, in October. Yes. And, 
and the music department is remarkable. I mean, really. Isn't I mean, Tan Dunn? Isn't Tan Dunn the head of music? That's correct. Tan <laughs> Dunn mean... is here, oh. and Stephanie Blythe, and and John Tower, and George Sontakis. And Don Upshaw has been up there for years. Many, many wonderful musicians. So I'm I'm very honored and very happy. Very happy to be here. And late, later, we'll rehearse with the orchestra. We'll no. do a little Vivaldi Four Seasons. With Leon? Um, I think, I'm hoping to see Leon. I don't think he'll be conducting us for the Four All Seasons, right. but, but hopefully for, for later. But he's really built up an oh. incredible place for music here. You know, his, his various symposium that he's done through the years with the requisite books that he himself then either forwards or afterwards or participates in are just a, a seminal part of my library. You know, I have, I mean, Leon Bonstein is just, you know. Well, he is so brilliant. Oh he is gosh. so brilliant and yeah. an absolute visionary. And what he's and built I, here is incredible. And it's a, it's a great fun. college. And he's so smart to get you there. I'm, I, you may tell him and tend I'm jealous. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. It's wow. great. Good. Very happy to be with you and very happy to be here. You know, Mazel tov, Shalom, Toda. much love. Toda. I see you. I see you. We see, we see you on Sunday. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss this concert. It's going to be a treat. Anyway, thank you for joining us for this hour of I Dodger Live with the great and wonderful, purely human, great guy, Gil Shaham. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Thank you, Gil. Good night.